Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the B&H Virtual Event Space. Very excited to be joined here by Sophia Elizabeth. Sophia, welcome to the event space. How are you today? Hi, I'm doing pretty fine. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's, it's our absolute pleasure. Uh, for those of you who are tuning in at home, thanks for joining us. We're talking about when the light is right, the shot is tight. So if you haven't had a chance to yet, I will highly implore you, and I'll, I'll let Sophia plug it herself, but I will highly implore you to go check out Sophia's work uh, on her social media pages and stuff like that. It's absolutely beautiful, and you'll get a, a really fine detail of what she's talking about and all of this stuff. We've got a lovely mannequin set up for you today, which is super exciting. We love, we love the mannequin. Uh, but I just want to remind everybody who's joining us here, whether it's on Zoom, Vimeo, Facebook, uh, you can ask any questions you may have for Sophia. By doing so, you could use the comment section on Vimeo or Facebook. If you're joining us here on Zoom, you can use the Q&A tab. But like I told Sophia before, I'm not going to take up any more of her time. I'm going to pass it over to her and let her get started. So thanks again for being here, and I'll see you back in a little bit. Awesome. Hello everyone, my name is Sophia Elizabeth Photography NYC, and I'm a photographer and videographer in Brooklyn, New York. I'm also the owner of Light Studio NYC 1 and Light Studio NYC 2, which are photos and video studios in Bushwick and Greenpoint, New York. And today I'm here to teach you how to get your light right, because when the light is right, the shot is tight. So throughout this webinar, as we, from the beginning to the end, one thing I really want to emphasize is the importance of lighting. That's why, again, the name of the workshop is when the light is right, the shot is tight. So let's start our presentation. Okay, okay. Studio portrait lighting workshop. Again, um, the webinar is at, at Studio Portrait Lighting Workshop. So we're doing all studio-related photography and studio-related lighting. Okay, okay. The goal for this workshop is to teach you guys how to better understand studio lighting so that you can produce better quality images in the studio. And the workshop is comprised of two parts. Um, the first part is pertains to lighting, and the second part is going to be about camera settings and also lenses. So again, lighting, and then camera setting and camera lenses. So let's start with the lighting portion. For the lighting portion, we have two parts. The light we're going to focus on light modifiers, and then one, two, and three lighting setups. Let's start with light modifiers. So what are light modifiers? So pretty much these are equipment or it can be any kind of a item or material that's used to change the look of your lighting. And the light modifiers that we're gonna focus on are the standard reflector, the beauty dish, the softbox, V-flats, gels and grids. So these are all different types of light modifiers and they all have different effect on the softness, the hardness, the, the way the light um, spreads or the way it, it basically helps to change the shapes, the shape or the look of the light pretty much. So let's start with the standard reflector. We're gonna focus mainly on the standard seven inch reflector. See, it's right up here. That's how it looks. It's pretty small, very small. It's about seven inch around on the front. And so these modifiers, um, they're very small. So if you can see in the sample photo, it gives you very harsh lighting. If you look at the image, you can see on this end here, the shadow, it's very apparent. So that's how you can tell that an image, that a lighting is harsh, when you can see the shadows very, when, it's, when the shadow is very dark, you know the lighting is really harsh. See right here, very, you can see the shadows very much, it's very, so you know the lighting is hard, is harsh. So let's close up, you can see on the subject's face, right over here, 
the shadows. It's very dark. So, you know, with this modifier, you can get very harsh and contrasting light. So if you're looking to do portraits or headshots or full body shots with very harsh lighting, you should use one of these modifiers for your light. So the next modifier is the beauty dish, one of my favorite modifiers ever. So like the first one, it does give you very harsh and contrasty light, but it's not as harsh as the smaller reflector. So the beauty dish helps you to add a lot of dimensions and shadows to the subject's face. But it's again, it's not as intense as the first modifier. You can see the shadow on over here. It's way less apparent compared to the first one. But you still see a shadow, but it's not as um, dark as the previous one. See right there in the face, over there, there's some shadows here. But again, still. So with this modifier, if you want to do headshots or portraits with some contrast or very harsh lighting, you should use a beauty dish. Just one thing to note: um, since with since the lightness can be very harsh or you know contrasty with a beauty dish, you have to be very careful about your subject because if you're using someone who has uh, bad skin or bad makeup, you might not want to use a beauty dish because you're gonna see. Everything on the face is gonna really, be really enhanced because like it's so harsh, you might wanna, preferably you wanna stick with somebody who has, well, decent skin when you're using these kind of modifiers because they really bring out everything, all the imperfections in the skin, it really brings out all the pimples, everything. So if you are gonna use a beauty dish, preferably you wanna have, make sure your subject has good skin or good makeup or whatever. And the next modifier, um, I would say these are my most used modifiers are the soft boxes. So compared to the first two modifiers, the soft box helps to really um, spread out your light. So it's a lot more softer and pleasing to the face. As you can see now, look at the shadows. There's not much shadows. So the soft box for this one, I think this one is a 42 inch soft box. So it really helps to spread out the light. So now you can see there's less shadows on the background now because of that right over there. Way less shadows compared to the previous two modifiers right there. Even the face right here, again, way less shadows. And the light is a lot more spread out and pleasing to the face and softer. I guess that's why it's a soft box. It softs and it's, well, it, I won't say it softs in the light. I don't want to, you know, repeat myself, but it do helps to soften the light. So let's compare the three modifiers. First, we had the reflect, the standard reflector, the beauty dish, and then the soft box. So now you can see, actually see the difference that they all make side by side. Let's go through the first one. Let's look at the shadows. The first modifier, the reflect the reflector, you see a lot of shadows on this side of the face. Compared to the beauty dish, you see some shadows, but not as much as the first one. And you look at the soft box, there is some shadows, but not, it's not as dark as the first modifier. Let's look at the shadows on the background. The first one, you can see the shadows is right there. Second one, you still, still you still do see some of the shadows, but it's not as apparent as the first one. And then the last one, you really don't see much of a shadow on your background. So if you want softer light, use a soft box as you can see. And in the soft box, the light is a lot more spread out on your background. So you get a lot more even distribution of your light compared to the beauty dish or the reflector. But again, if you, it depends on what you're looking for. So if you wanna do some portraits with really harsh sunlight, well, light. If you wanna, I guess if you wanna mimic the sunlight, you might want a harsher light source. So maybe a reflector or beauty dish might work. But if you want more softer light that's pleasing to the face, use a soft box. But if you want that harsh look and the shadow and contrasty look, use a reflector or a beauty dish. Okay, so that's done. So 
The next modifier is the V flat, one of my favorites. So these are pretty much, um, I would say cardboard. They have two slides, two sides, the white side and then the black side. So each side serves a different purpose. Let me show you what they do. So the white side, it minimizes, it minimizes shadows. So it helps to reflect. So if you have, let me just show you, let me just show you how it looks. <laughs> so for example, right? So in the first image, we have just one light. It's over here. It's at a 45 degree angle above the subject. There she is. She's killing it over there. And that's without the V flat. So now let's add in the V flat. So I added two V flat on each side of the subject's face. As you can see, let me zoom in. So this is how it looks without the V flat on the white side. And this is how it looks with the V flat on the white side. As you can see, there is a huge difference. So the white side, the white side really helps to fill in those shadows because white reflects and black kind of subtracts light. So you see the white side. So we have that one light again on the top, two V flats on the side. And you can see it really helps to bring out the subject's face. So if you have, if you're doing a one light setup and you want to fill in your shadows, use a V flat on the white side, pretty much. Okay, let's go to the other side, which is the black side. So black again, Oh, these are, I uh, forgot. This one is a extra kind of setup that you can do with the V flat on the white side. So this is a good headshot setup you can do. So you have one V flat here and other one on the bottom of the subject. And that helps you to give you a nice, even light distribution. Let's go to the black side. So black minimizes light. So again, black subtracts light compared to white, which reflects the light. So the black side now is going to give you more shadows on the face so for example right this first image is how it looks on the white side and the next one is how it looks on the black side as you can see with the back the black side of the v flat you see a lot more you see a lot more shadows on like the cheekbones and the nose so a lot of the light that was reflected back on the white side is now taken away once you put the V-flat on the black side. So again, remember, V-flat, one of the, I love to use V-flat for, um, for my studio portraits. So whenever I wanna do maybe one light setup, I might just have a V-flat on one side and then the other light, the light on the other side. And that helps me to really, on the white side to, to kind, of, kind of fill in those shadows on my subject. Okay, and the next, modifier are the gels. So these are pretty much um, pieces of plastic, colored plastic that you put in front of your light to help to change the color temperature or the look, the color of your light. That's pretty much what they are. They're just plastic, colored plastic that's used to modify the color or the temperature, the color temperature of your light, pretty much. So let's start with the gels. So I want you guys to see the, the, how much of a difference it makes to use a gel. So this is, how the, this is how it looks like right now without a gel. For this setup, I have two lights. There is one light over here. That's a strip box, a 56 inch long strip box right over here. And in the back, I have a rim light with a one of the seven inch reflector right in the back there. So two lights set up. That's how it looks without the gel. And once I add in the gel, that's how it looks. You can see the difference it makes. So I added the gel to the rim light in the back. And now my background looks red. Crazy. <laughs> Again, we're using, this is a white background. So with a gel, with gels, I can make a white background look red. It's crazy. So let's say you're on a budget and you can just you can just afford one white background. 
with gels, you can make that white background look, look um, red, blue, green, any color that you wanted to make with gels. If you're in a budget, just get a white background. You make it look red, again, red, blue, all of that with just gels. So let me show you a, a, a fun tip that I love to do. I love to mix and match colors. One of my favorite combinations of gels is um, red and blue. So these are some of the colors that you can get by matching a red and a blue gel. For this, I had, so the red gel on this side, the blue gel on the other side behind the subject. And these are some of the images, the combinations of the color combination that I got. We can get purple, <laughs> we can get blue, we can get a mauve color. So these are some of the colors that you can get by mixing a red gel and a blue gel. Sky is the limit. And the same, you can even mix other colors like maybe red and green or uh, yellow and blue. Sky is the limit. Again, it's all about practicing, doing different setups and see what works or what depends on what look that you're going for. You can determine whether you want to use a gel or a reflector or a soft box. But for these, gels. I love gels. We see the combination. And you can get this combination dependent on how where your light is aimed. So like for the first, this one here, I think I had the light, the lights were aimed opposite each other. So one here and one here and boom. But this one I had the red light aimed, I think it was the one. No, I think for this one, I had the red light at a lower power than a blue light. So not, that's why you see more blue than red. For that one, I had the red and the blue, similar powers, but they were aimed a bit more. We had more, no, there's more blue in this one. So red and blue, blue, boom, purple. So it all depends on the light power. So if you have one light, one light that's uh, more powerful than the other, obviously you might have a different color than if you just, just talk about mixing your colors, your light power and the angle of your lights, you're gonna have different color combination. So these are some other combinations that you can do also. So with these, I just have the two lights in the back and no main light. So you can see with this one, the red on that side, blue over here, and you have a nice blue background. Very nice creative look. With this one here, I have the red aimed behind the subject's back and the blue aimed at the subject's face. So you have a purple background. Boom, very nice. Lots of shadows, very dramatic. And now for this setup, you can get more of a pink background by aiming your red light at the background or the, the paper and then the blue light at the subject. So now you have red on her face, blue on her face, and then pink in the back. It's crazy, right? <laughs> so these are some combinations that you can do just by using or mixing red and blue gels. Crazy, right? <laughs> gels are amazing. Okay, so um, that is good. Let's now go to grids. What are grids? So grids are pretty much, again, these are light modifiers. You use these to help to minimize the spread of your light. A lot of times you're using modifiers and the light is spreading all over the place. So by using a grid or adding a grid to your modifier is gonna help you to keep the light focused on whatever you're pointing it at. For example, so again, this is a one light setup. We have the strip box, 56 inch strip box over here on the subject. Really deep. This is a very basic light setup. And this is how it looks with a grid added to the soft box. Crazy. <laughs> so I added the grid to my main light. It helps to minimize the spill of the light. So pretty much the light is gonna be um, going in the direction of whatever I'm pointing it at. So now it's going at my subject 
and there's less light spilling on to the background. So that's why it looks like the, the background looks um, black instead of um, gray, white, whatever, because the grid helps to keep the light focused on whatever you're pointing it at. As you can see, it's a huge difference. Just by adding on a grid onto your modifier, it makes a big difference, crazy. So now let's add a grid to a light with the gels. Let's combine the three. Good. So now by adding a grid to your modifier, when you're using a gel, you get even more pigmented um, backgrounds or gel images, gel light. That makes sense. Because now you have less of your lights going onto the background. You can see more of your gel, gelled light in the back. So before you have no grid, the filter, the gel on the light in the back. So some of the light from your main, your main um, strobe is spilling onto your background. So it's kind of mixing with your background. So it looks kind of, it looks red, but not as red as it could be. So by adding the grid onto your main light, you have less of the light spilling onto your background. So it looks red. Look at that. It's crazy. Listen, lighting is crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> Remember guys, when the light is right, the shot is tight. There's so much you can do with just a combination of grids and, um, and some filth and some um, gels. There's so much you can do. Look at this, it's crazy. So here are some other combinations. So again, the zoom in without the grid and now with the grid. So whenever you're using, um, I always advise whenever you're using um, uh, gels to use, to have your main light be with a grid because you don't want to have your background look washed out. So you kind of want to have, either have your subject away from the background or have a grid onto your main light. So then there's not too much of the light from your main light source being spilled in onto the background. So use a grid to help to minimize the light spill onto your background so you can see more of your um, gelled light in the background. But look at the difference, it's crazy. It's crazy. That's why I'm obsessed with lighting because there's so much you can do in the studio, guys. <laughs> so these are some combinations. If you wanna use a, a flash plus a beauty dish, with a uh, gel or a strip box. You can see with the beauty dish, the light is more focused on the face. And then the grid with a strip box, the, the light is much more, it covers more of the subject's body. Right there. Difference. So again, a, with a beauty dish modifier, you it's probably better to use for portraits because it's more, it's much more smaller and it's gonna is most it's gonna cover most of the face. While with a strip box, you get more coverage of your subject. Okay, we're finished with the grid. So I guess we can get into the Q and A. Awesome. So I mean in terms of in terms of mixing and matching, you know, different light sources, is there kind of any rule of thumb there or is it just kind of you know mix and match kind of how you like it and and find what works for you um certain colors do go well with certain colors um like for example you saw just now the red and the blues are really good <laughs> those two colors you can make purple you can make pink you can make so many different colors while certain colors, I was maybe like a blue and let's say blue and green, maybe might. But at the end of the day, you really have to um, try different things to see what works. Because sometimes you might discover, maybe might discover certain colors, might go with certain colors or not. So it's really all about um, trying different things and see what works because you never know. There's no, there's really no, um, no, uh, I would say. Rule. Yeah, it's really <laughs> what works for you or just 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 trying different things and see what works because you never know 
right. so with lighting and photography. Me. <laughs> Definitely. Sky's the limit. Definitely. All right, let's keep rolling. Okay, okay. Go back. So we did the grids. And now for the second portion, we are going to do some just some one, two, and three light setups. Um, pretty much just some quick. So these are my go to setups for I do a lot of maternity sessions. And I use, love to use strip boxes. I believe that strip boxes are some of the most underrated modifiers ever. Because <laughs> most, most people use, they use the big lights, the big 60 inch soft boxes and the umbrellas. But I love to use strip boxes because they really help to isolate, to, to isolate my subject pretty much from the background. So one of my favorite setups um, for my maternity sessions are the one light setup using a strip box. Because usually I have my subject, like the mother placed, turn like sideways with the modifier on one side. And that really helps to bring out like her belly or just to separate her from the background. So these are, this is one of my go-to lighting setups with the strip box. Again, you can use any modifier with this one light setup. You can use a, a big, a beauty dish, a reflector, a soft box, but the one light off to the side, any any modifier with this one light setup, pretty much. But this is my go-to one light setup for to isolate, well, to isolate my subject from the background. And another, so a two light setup. So for my two light setup, I love to use two strip boxes. So I would have one strip box on the one side and the other one as a rim light in the back. So this really helps to bring my subject, give her a bit more, well, him or her, <laughs> help to really separate them more from the background because it adds a nice little rim light to the back. You can see over here, the extra light really helps to add some dimension to the photo. Get the main light over here, boom. Yeah, pretty simple, two light setup. Again, you can do the same thing, the same setup with other modifiers. Like you can add a soft box over here, a soft box or a beauty dish over here or an umbrella soft box over here, and then do a reflector, a seven inch reflector over here. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. But this is kind of my go-to setups for again, my maternity sessions or any session where I want to really isolate my subject from the background. And then for a three light setup, um, my go-to, most of my portraits, I always do, I'm about to maybe 80% of the times I do this setup where I have two rim lights in the back, which are usually the strip boxes in the back and then a main light source in front here. Um, it can be a small um, soft box or a large umbrella soft box in front. So this really, covers, helps to cover a lot of um, the subject. So with this kind of setup, she's not gonna be super dark. She's very covered. She's covering this side, that side, on the front, or him or her. <laughs> but you can see, this is a very nice, clean setup. You can't go wrong with a three light setup like this, honestly. So these are pretty much some simple setups that I would suggest, but again, you can, swap these in for any modifier if you want to use a beauty dish in the front and a to the, the strip box in the back you can do that also again you just want to try different things and see what works because at the end of the day there's no um rule in a sense but it's really what works for you and what look that you're going for so again if you want to do more dramatic, um, like dramatic portrait shots. You might want to do one light with the, the strip box on the side where the subject is lit and then it's like more dark in the back. So it, it depends, depends. If you want a more bright and eerie shot, you might want to do something like this where everything is nice and lit, pretty much. One, two, three light setups. Okay, let's go to part two which is the final part of the workshop. And for this portion, we're gonna do focus on camera, specifically 
your camera settings and lenses, preferably that you want to use inside of the studio to really enhance the look of your portraits. So let's start with camera settings. So when you're in studio, there's certain kind of um, settings or well, setting lenses that you want to use to optimize the look to get the best look in portraits ever. So preferably you want to shoot in manual mode. Manual mode. I mean, this is kind of, I mean, as a, if you're a photographer and you're, you want to get serious, you have to shoot in manual because you want to be able to control all of your settings pretty much. So manual, you have to be able to control your aperture, your eye, everything. You have to be able to control everything. You want to be able to control everything. So you have full control because when you're inside, it's all up to you. you. You have to know how to do manual on your camera. And then your ISO. I always, well, I don't, well, it's kind of, you kind of have to shoot at your lowest when you're indoors. So some cameras might go to ISO 50, some cameras 100, 200. So it depends on your, your model, your camera model. You preferably want to shoot at the lowest ISO on your camera so that you don't have, and you don't want to have grain in your image. So you want to shoot at your IS, your lowest ISO whenever you're in studio and the aperture. I would, so to get the, to get more details, because whenever you're indoors, you really don't have to worry about, um, you know, you're not, you're not outside where it's super bright. And so when you're inside and you want to have, you want to do, get really clean and crispy portrait shots, you want to shoot at a high F-stop. And for you, so usually I shoot around F8, F8, 10, 11, depends on, um, the light in, and that gives me nice and crispy portrait shots when I'm in the studio. And your shutter speed. I'll say between one over 100 and one over 200. And the focal length, um, anything below 200. So if you wanna do more, uh, maybe headshots, you might wanna get a lens that's, a telephoto lens that's, Seven, seven, 70 millimeter to between 70 and 200 millimeter. If you want to do some wide angle shots in the studio, you want to, might want to get a wide angle lens, like a 24 millimeter or 35 millimeter, which isn't that wide. It depends on, but probably you want to stay below 200 because I mean, if you want to into a studio and you shoot with a 400 millimeter lens, you might not have enough space to hold to shoot a full body shot. So preferably stay below 200 or 200 and below for your focal length. So let's give, let's talk about some portrait lenses. Um, so again, depends on the look that you're going for. Um, we're gonna cover some, well, some macro lenses, telephone lenses and zoom lenses. So I read a macro. So if you're, if you wanna do more uh, macro portrait photography, um, a macro lens will allow you to get really close up to your subject with not having to, you know, get up all up in your face. So I love to do macro photography when I'm doing beauty portraits. Like for example, this you see is very close to her face, lots of details and like this. So if you're in a studio, you wanna do more macro portrait photography. It can be, it can, it can be, it can be people or even small items. I would say, suggest to get a macro lens. You can get really nice up and close in the face, in the eyes, the nose, whatever. Get a macro lens. So there's the different types of macro lenses. There's telephoto macro lenses. There is the wide angle macro lens. So it depends on what, I guess, your budget. And then the telephoto lens. So if you want to get really close up on your close up shots of your portraits without having to get super close all up in your face, get a telephoto lens, which are basically lenses that are above 70 millimeter, pretty much can be 200, 100 millimeter, um, 200 millimeter for it. It's pretty much anything above 70 millimeter. That's a telephoto lens. So if you're like me and you like to get really close up shots without having to get too close to your subject, 
get like for these shots i used my um go back to that for these shots i used um what was the lens i think i had this was shot with the sigma 105 millimeter you can see at f9 you see a lot of the background and f1.4 there isn't much of the background so the, this is a telephoto low aperture lens very compressed in the background. So I would say if you want to do studio portraits, studio portrait photography, to get a telephoto, well, you don't have to. So you might want to get a telephoto lens just to kind of be able to do super close up shots without having to get super close to the subject's face. And then the last one are the zoom lenses. So with these kind of lenses, it gives you a lot of um, versatility with your focal length. So um, when you're in a studio, if you want to be able to go to get wide shots and then super close up shots without having to move in to be without having to move all over the place, I would suggest to get a zoom lens in for your indoor shots. Like I love to use the Canon 24 to 70 and the 70 to 200 in the 70 to 200 indoors because it allows me to get really tight shots and then wide shots without having to move, you know, in and out all the time. For example, like for these shots, I used my um, 70 to 200. I got some wide shots like this, some mid range, and then super zoomed in. All of this at the same position. So I was here and I didn't have to move much, but I still got some wide shots and then some mid range and then some zoom in shots at the same position. So if you're like me and you get a bit lazy sometimes in the studio, get a zoom lens that allows you to get some wider shots and then some zoom in shots without having to move too much back and forth. <clears throat> Yeah, so we pretty much went over everything. So our modifiers. So the first portion was the light modifiers, which are the pretty much the most knowing how to use it kind of modifiers, different situations is going to help your lighting a lot. Depends on the again, depends on the look that you're going for. If you want to do more harsh, um, do more like harsh. Um, very shot portions of a lot of shadows and contrast and highlights. You might want to use a beauty dish or a, a reflector, or if you want to do more softer light, you might want to use a softbox. So it all depends on what you're going for. If you want to be able to change the color of your light, use gels, all of these different things, just knowing how, what to use and how, when to use them in the studio is going to help your light in a lot. Because again, Photography is all about a light in. So I hope these tricks help you to help give you some ideas how to get your lights right. Because at the end of the day, when the light is right, the shot is tight. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> do you want me? Do you, Do you want me to get out of here? I could leave. <laughs> no, no, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sophia's gonna wrap it up for us tonight. <laughs> um, no, that was that was that was totally wonderful and a ton of great information. Um, before we get into the questions, and uh, just a reminder to everybody, if you do have questions that you want to get answered, uh, please throw them in there. Um, how can people find you? Oh yes, let me just um take off the screen and go back to the original screen. How do I go back to, it doesn't matter. So you can find me on um, Instagram at WilliamsSophia15 on Instagram, or you can follow also my studio. Um, it's Light Studio NYC on Instagram. And my website, oh, it's right here, see? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So everything's right here. My email address, you can contact me here and the studio's website and email address. Awesome, wonderful. Now, you talked, you talked about, you know, like a uh, seven inch reflector, you talked about strip box, soft box. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, what about, what are your feelings on 
just standard handheld reflectors, like a 32 inch, 42 inch reflector, or even just like umbrellas. How do you, are, are you just not a fan of those or do you just prefer to use, you know, a bigger soft body? If you're laughing, <laughs> smile, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I'm a fan. Um, it's just that I wanted to focus on specific mod because there's so many types of modifiers. I kind of want to focus on specific ones for this. But um, the, a regular reflector works the same way as a V-flat works. You have the, the silver side that reflects the light. You have the, most reflectors do have like a, a black side that adds more shadows to your subject. So you can use, it. it's the same, you know, same thing. Um, and an umbrella, I don't really use umbrellas that much. I don't use umbrellas much. <laughs> That's a, that's all right. That's fine. But I those mean, are good modifiers too. You know, if you want to help to spread your light out, you can use an umbrella. Yeah, could have used an umbrella today. Thing. It was it was pouring in Brooklyn, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, you, use, you can use outdoors and indoors. <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, dual dual usage. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. You know, and we talked we talked a lot about lighting. We talked a lot about using strobes. I mean, do you prefer to use? Are you more of a strobe person? Do you use LEDs at all? Do you feel like constant light is something that you like to play with at all? Yes, I love both. I love to use strobe lights and LED lights. Like I'm obsessed with lighting. So whatever gives me light, <laughs> that's what I love to use. Like one of my favorite setups, like I love LED lights, especially color LED lights. So I love, I have two, these tube lights. I have these lights that do different effects. I come when I'm in the studio, just like doing a whole bunch of craziness with just lights. <laughs> right. And I even love to use, um, for my, a lot of my photo shoots, I love to use projectors just the regular projectors wow. to make backgrounds and then add like LED lights and tube lights. It's like, awesome. so I, I can just... use strobe lights and constant lights. It just depends. Again, depends on what I'm going for. If I want to do something where, if I want to mimic like a sunset, I might do a LED, uh, color LED lights or some tube lights. So it's all about, or a spotlight. So it all depends on what I'm trying to, the look I'm trying to achieve. Yeah, my, that's so, that's awesome. Yeah. I I think I think that's the first time that I've ever heard somebody talk about at least here um, using an actual projector as a light, which yeah. I think is really cool. That, that could be a different webinar, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm I'm interested in that because when you when you use something like that, are you using it as a as just a bare bulb projector, or do you try to kind of create um, some kind of like directional piece? to direct that light a little bit more focused onto the subject. Mm -hmm. I mean like the projector, the, um, the standard projector. Yeah. On the projector itself, do you try to like, yeah. do you try to direct that light or do you just let it kind of spill out? I so depends. So, well, might be kind of, cause there's kind of two that I would say two types of projector. There's the ones that you can use it. The regular ones you use at home to watch movies. So I use those sometimes to like make a background. Like for, for example, the other day I use a projector to add a picture of a sky to, a, to my white, the, to the background paper. And then, so I had the projector, the picture of the sky in the background. Then I had a spotlight to make a circle on this, on my, well, on my, on my face. So um, yeah, but I usually use projectors to just to add like actual picture to background. So I did another one with a sunset. So I added a picture of a sunset on my background and added like used the projector to just to cover, just to light my face. So awesome. yeah, I'm not like blending into the, the background. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I think that's super cool and inventive and something that. Yeah, I, I think it will be a nice it. workshop. It's um, constant light. Lighting is an LED light with LED lights. It's a whole different world. It's a whole different world. Now you mentioned something that that I wanted to hint on. Um, you mentioned about the backgrounds, um, and I know people when they're when they're first getting started and they're just looking at you know creating maybe a small little studio or an area for shooting mm -hmm. indoors. Uh, there's obviously just regular seamless background paper, and then yeah. there's obviously you can go with muslins. Different you know companies make different sizes. You know you can you can find something nine feet by twelve feet. You can find you know, the, the seamless rolls and like mm -hmm. six inches, you know, what's, what do you feel is the better sort of, I guess, investment, so to speak, in mm -hmm. that is it, is it better to start off with something like a seamless 
or is a muslin better because you know it's it's a little bit thicker material it can get creased a little bit more you can maybe iron it out you know what do you what do you recommend for that um i would recommend it's a good question though I mean, when I started photography, I did remember buying a gray, um, gray fabric. And that was pretty versatile, um, but it wrinkled a lot. But then I also bought, um, well, I started with, I would say I started with fabric. I bought a um, velour fabric, a black velour fabric. One of the most versatile fabric to use that doesn't wrinkle is velour. So I think if you're starting out, you want to get like backdrops that are reusable to use fabric specifically velour fabric because it doesn't wrinkle so you can get like some in gray color or black or red and like, they don't wrinkle and they last for a long time but if you do have money for paper white i would paper. suggest to get um white paper or gray paper because those are very versatile because with, with your lighting you can make a white uh, white or gray people look black or white or gray and then by adding gels to a white or a gray background you can make them look different colors so it's very so white and gray are two very versatile colors you can make them look you can use a use um grades to make them change colors or even make it look dark or what or brighter awesome now we or, did get this question about uh the color gels which you spoke about but the color gels do you direct it onto the subject or backdrop? It depends. Um, sometimes I, for the most, most of the times I don't have them aimed at the person or the backdrops. Usually it's kind of between. So between, like, this is the subject, this is the background and it's between them. Cause a lot of times when you have it into the background, it can make like a, like a hot, like a hot spot. So it's like one spot is super bright and other around it is just kind of weird. It's not really like the actual color. It's kind of weird. But if you want to kind of have in the way from the background, so it's like it kind of it's more evenly distributed. And if it's you can do some where the light is at this end of the subject, but again, it depends on what you're looking for. So but usually I have it aimed at the subject behind or away from the background. And yeah, between like behind the subject or away from the background. Cause usually when it's at the background, it's gonna look, it's gonna make like really uneven, you know, light distribution. Sure. Now Ron wanted to know um, in, in particular, this image that you have up on the screen, um, oh. was the effect on that image created with a projector or a gobo? Um, that was created with a spotlight with a gobo. So it had the, the spotlight with a, like a star filter, well, gobo inside of it and it made that effect on the subject's face. Awesome. So many, so many different things. Max, Mac wanted to know, uh, what's your, what's your take on using an optical snoot? Um, I mean, that's technically what this is, what the, the photo is. There's so many different names. There's people call it projector, spotlight, snoot but they all are the same thing. It's the same thing here. You add the, 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 um, the gobo to the snoot and boom, you can make an effect. But I love to use, when I'm using LED lights, I love to use my spotlight and add different effects like this, pretty much. Awesome. Yeah, pretty much. Awesome. Well, Sophia, I want to say thank you very much for being here and sharing the information with us. I think there's a ton of great information that came out of that, especially one of my, one of my favorite things is, is the grid. I, I'm, I'm terrible. I, we spoke about this before I told you I'm terrible when it comes to lighting. So you know, full, full disclosure there. I'm, I'm not big. I'm not, I'm not, you know, my ego is not big enough that I can't, can't say that I, I don't get it. <laughs> and, and really, really seeing the grid and how, you know, how much of a difference it makes and, and that yeah. side comparison really, really, hopefully other people at home besides just me took stuff away from that. But I definitely took, you know, a lot away from this because I think that lighting is always the part that people get challenged with. It is. And it's, it's really 
difficult and it could be nerve wracking and intimidating. And I think, you know, you had a nice leisurely approach about it. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think, I think your love of light comes through. You just love light. That's it. You're, you're all about the light. <laughs> you're shining. That's it. Because so, that's what I do. <laughs> that's, it, right? I, that's why I coined a phrase when the light is right. Shot is tight. And, and I think, and I think that's hundred percent correct. Um, I want to thank you for being here. And I know that we'll definitely see you sometime in the future soon. Um, and I want to thank everybody at home for tuning in. But that has been another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space in the Books. We'll catch you next time.